over to Chris in Arizona and you would like to know when was the last cheetah seen on Safari Live because you've been watching for quite some time without seeing one and phew, I can't even remember when the last one was seen. I've only seen cheetah on three different occasions in the whole year that I've been here, Chris. So they are around, but we don't see them very, very often, sadly. There are not many of them, and the reason for that is that there's a high density of leopard and lion, and cheetah are overpowered and killed by both leopard and lion due to competition. So sadly, also due to this very thick vegetation, which isn't really suitable for them, even though they can live here, they prefer more open areas. So there's a chance we will see them. They, w they will pop up at some stage, but I can't for the life of me remember when the last one was seen. It must have been quite a few months back. I'm just going to move this tree out the way, make sure to not fall on my bottom like Jamie did yesterday. and I'm looking forward to actually watching that highlight it sounds like it was hilarious some of you may have been lucky enough to see, see that she did redeem herself later on and on the drive and she went back to that same tree that she needed to move out the road and successfully conquered it she said she was crying with laughter though she became inoperational she found it so funny and I'm sure a lot of you felt the same way. That was thanks to the elephants, our exterior decorators who tend to move around the furniture out here for us. And I'm trying to check for tracks on the ground, but there's two issues that we're facing now. One of which is that it is overcast making it very difficult to see tracks without any sunlight beaming down on them and casting shadows on the corners of the toe prints and the pug marks. And the other problem is that after the rain, the ground actually kind of almost solidifies like cement. It becomes very hard. Therefore, if a leopard had have walked down this road, it'll be very difficult to see its tracks. And what we need is to drive around as many of the roads as possible churning up the sand making it a fine powder which is a better substrate for a track to be left in so basically i'm just throwing some excuses at you for not finding anything yet Florida and Mike as we drove through the Milwaukee riverbed a little bit earlier on I did keep an eye out for those gray hooded kingfishers couldn't see any and I'm told you know 218 birds on your bird list so well done with that that's really good going Mike's interested to know not about birds now but about an aardvark or an ant bear and they in this area are almost strictly nocturnal whereas in other parts of Africa they move during the day and that's probably a large reason why we don't see them very often other than of course on this the male leopards caught them that's the most frequent time I've seen aardvark in the Sabi Sands is when they're dead and in the grips of a leopard and Mike there are a few areas where we know aardvark are fairly active um, off Balanites Road, we've actually seen one before on a, just a late night drive. Some of our crew we were lucky enough to see one. Um, and interestingly enough, often there's flies that obviously travel with aardvarks as they move. And when aardvark move back into a kind of area of burrows, they usually have more than one. But whichever burrow they go into, the flies will line the entrance to that burrow waiting for the aardvark to leave and then they hop on and move with it through the night, I guess. So you can almost tell which burrow out of a network of burrows the aardvark has gone into. And 
here. So if we got a camera trap, that would be useful because then we'd be able to erect it there and get some pictures and videos of the, the aardvark leaving those burrows. But I unfortunately do not have that toy in my arsenal of gadgets. But yeah, a camera trap would be a useful investment to be able to monitor things like that. I don't know the specific hole though, Mike, that is being currently used, but if we wanted to, we would be able to probably work that out if we scoured the area around Balanites. Because that's where we are fairly certain they hang out. It's a dangerous area to off-road because when you're driving through an area ridden with aardvark burrows, there's a chance you may fall into one. I think Jamie had that unfortunate fate not too long ago. Genevieve in New York and thanks for the kind welcome back. Genevieve's interested to know what exactly causes my interest in ornithology because it can be a bit of a tricky subject and you're right Genevieve it's a tricky one and I guess it's just the fact that everything arch is interconnected and interrelated and it's really important to factor in all the animals not just the big furry ones. Another thing I love about birds is that there's a lot of small birds that are quite easy to overlook. And once you do manage to show people or get some binoculars onto them, or in our case, get the camera zoomed tightly on them, you can show people that there's immense beauty surrounding us that's quite easily overlooked. Obviously, another thing about ornithology is the fact that, like you said, it's not an easy subject and that kind of challenge induces you know humans kind of natural reaction to want to overcome a challenge and understand how to differentiate between the different species i've been very fortunate though genevieve there was a teacher at my junior school so i was about 10 years of age at the time and she was mad about birds and she actually started a bird club for us and we would go out bird watching as a kind of midweek activity once a week we would go out and drive along the various areas of kind of vegeta natural vegetation or the river that flows through my hometown called Durban and she definitely had a fundamental impact on my interest in birds her and her husband actually squeezed us all into their combi or minibus I don't know what the general term would be for that vehicle but yeah a small little bus and her and her husband drove about 10 of us all the way up to the Kruger National Park it's about a 10 hour drive from Durban a minivan that's better and that must have been a serious undertaking having 10 little rat bags causing chaos in their car for 10 hours and then having to try and teach us all the different birds and animals in the Kruger National Park so very very privileged with having that lady. Now, I think this is an opportune moment for some of you guys to have a crack at what bird you think this is to try and induce the challenge of the different species that we get out here. I've got an idea of who I think it is. I'll give you one clue and that is that you get slightly different color variations of them and the first person to send through the correct answer will be the ornithologist of the day so don't delay hashtag safari live on twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv to let us know who you think this is tricky the birds of prey because they all do look quite similar and you really have to look at the finer details to work out who's who but the general impression and size and shape 
are the, the main things you want to look for, and then you kind of got to go with your gut feel to a degree. The tail is a good indicator in this in, uh, instance, as well as the head, when the wind is at the right angle, it causes the little crest to pop up. Well done to Wayne, the ornithologist. Uh, you bastard bird. You are 100% correct. It is the Warburg's eagle. And just to help everyone else who may not be in tune with the eagles as much as you are, Wayne, we're going to just get it out in the book, or at least attempt to, and be able to show the reasons why this is the Warburg. So in the bottom right here, you will notice that you get the pale form, which we saw yesterday afternoon, for those of you who are with us. And then above, they've got the dark form flying. Now, not easy to see, but there's a tiny little crest displayed here. It's not always up, and like I said, depending on the wind, it can sometimes be flattened. But they do have a little crest and a long, straight tail. Helps to tell who's, who that is, as well as their size. So well done to Wayne. But as you look in the rest of this page, I mean, the brown raptor all looks kind of similar. And sometimes you have to look at the finer details, like the little gape on the mouth, how far that goes back with the step eagle and the tawny eagle. The only difference or the major difference between distinguishing them is just on that mouth part. And the tawny eagle's gape finishes kind of in line with its eye whereas the step eagle's gape extends ever so slightly behind the eye. So, tricky stuff. But there are ways of telling the distance, oh yeah, maybe this is going to work for us. There's... No. That noise that you just heard was some lilac-breasted rollers. I'm going to creep forward to sh try and get VM a better angle to show you them. And when they make that noise, they'll often actually fly up in circles, ascending to a decent height before they do their rolling display. I've yet to be able to... I've yet to be able to actually show you this though. Oh, them higher up. No, those are European rollers though and they've already flown straight over us. But let's keep an eye on them. I'm going to turn around quickly because there's a chance we may be able to get them doing their display. No. No luck with the rollers there. And James Taylor, very, very happy to hear that you have enjoyed getting into the bird watching scene. It takes a bit of time and patience, but 26 birds on your list already is a good start. And I don't think it's going to take you that many years, actually. I think it's just going to take you a few more months. You'll be surprised how quickly you can get to grips with things. And you just watch, in a couple of months' time, you're going to be much better than I think you're giving yourself credit for. Thank you to Lorraine for confirming with us the last dates that she thinks we saw Cheetah. And Chris, I guess you're going to have to thank Lorraine for this. And it was on the 5th of August, and it was two male Cheetah that Brent was following. And I actually remember that day clearly because James and I were helping stay with those Cheetah while... Brent was looping ahead, they were moving through some thick bush at one stage, and Brent made the fatal mistake during that drive of, while he was narrating and chatting to you guys as the cheetahs walked past the vehicle, the camera was on the cheetah, 
and he was looking directly at myself and James and he kept eye contact with us for far too long so we started behaving inappropriately in order to throw him off his game which we did superbly and obviously you guys had no idea about that because the camera was on the cheetah that were walking past you just would have probably noticed that Brent stopped halfway through his sentence and battled to recover whatever he was trying to tell you guys so that's a little behind the scenes story of what happened on that fine afternoon of August the 5th and thank you Lorraine for confirming that that was the last time we saw Cheetah. in Connecticut and the question you've asked is going to be a tricky one to answer but uh, I do feel that the animals do have the ability of sensing where they're coming in and Julianne would like to know if we can confirm that that is actually a fact but it's so difficult to tell you know every day is different animals come and go regardless of the weather but I've heard so many different reports of animals being able to sense weather and therefore move into various areas to either avoid the weather or maybe be in the correct area to receive that weather. So I think they certainly, some animals do have the potential to do that, but I've never actually been clearly been able to see it or, or calculate def definitively that they do have that ability. So. There's too many fluctuations in general here on a daily basis with animal movements without the weather and you'd be able to, you'd need to really research things very very closely in order to be able to conclusively confirm that but I do think that they do have that ability I do have that feeling but nothing conclusive to, to confirm it sadly okay we need to race you across to a very cute sighting Toodle I keep my voice down because look what we found it's okay little one you can come out oh. Oh. look how wobbly you are all right mom don't stress I think we just missed our live kudu birth. Mm. Just. Oh, wow. Tiny, wobbly little creature. It's still damp. Having one of its first meals. This thing cannot be much older than an hour or two. It's still wobbly, still slightly damp. Mm, Mom's tail looks, I think, a little bit damp as well. I think this little one was born this morning. I can't see an umbilical cord, though. She's the only thing that made me doubt. Look at it, butting, Mom. Look at it. Come on, Mom. I want breakfast. I want breakfast. Hello, beautiful girl. Well done. Well done. Hello, baby. <laughs> days and days and days of waiting and following and stopping to look at every single pregnant kudu in Juma. Look at that. Look at his little tail wagging. That's adorable. And how lucky are we that she's comfortable enough to show us this moment? Oh, look how wobbly it is. This is incredible. Look at how long its baby's legs are. Now oh, this is a very, very, very special moment. Well done, Mom. 
She's actually not on her own, but the rest of the kudu have moved away from us. Look how fluffy and damp it is still. Still a bit sticky. Mom doing a thorough clean. And that's very common to witness as soon as they become mothers. That's their instinct. It's also to stimulate the first defecation. And those of you who have hand raised puppies or kittens before, you know that you sometimes have to rub them to help them out a little bit. And her instinct tells her to do that with her baby. Here you go. You can see the nipples. Actually, I'm not sure this is as young as I thought it was. She's not swollen at all. Although her tail does is damp and sticky, but maybe it's a bit older than a few hours. I mean, the little one is very wobbly, so it's definitely born in the early hours of the morning. Look at it suckling. How cool is that? You can actually see how much it's drinking, how fast it's gulping the milk down. Oh, next nipple. And then gentle head butts to stimulate the milk to flow out. Just like kittens do, where they need their mothers with their paws. All little antelope species do this. They headbutt their mothers. How absolutely incredible is this? We have got so lucky. Welcome to the world, little one. Only a couple of hours old and already famous. Skinny, wobbly, but with long, long legs to help be able to reach up like it's doing now to suckle. Also to be able to keep up with mom. How precious is this? This is an incredible moment. That she feels so comfortable, or she feels comfortable enough with us here. And that could well be from time spent with these kudu to actually allow us to watch her while she's standing in the road. What a beautiful story. I'm going to get there in a moment. It's just so I'm mesmerized watching this little kudu move. Just goes to show you never know what to expect around that corner. I didn't expect that. Back to breakfast again. Mom back to cleaning. And Teresa Williams has told the most incredible local myth that the kudu and the inyala at the beginning of their creation weren't able to stand on their skinny legs. And so the creator reached down and lifted them up and left white marks wherever they were touched. I love that. I think that's one of probably one of the best stories behind the explanation or just so story almost that I've ever heard. Myth and a legend, I love it. That must be my favorite one. Thank you for that, Teresa. That's beautiful. Such a tiny little creature. And I find this whole process fascinating. And Margaret, you've said that it's incredible that the antelope little baby Little baby kudu knows already to headbutt to stimulate milk production. I find them incredible. The fact that they know instinctively from the minute they are born that they have to get up on their feet, that they have to be up and moving, that they're able to get up and walk within minutes of entering this world with all of its stimulation and its light and its noise and its smells. And they know that the first thing they need to do is find mom and have a snack 
blows my mind. Margaret, I agree with you. That instinct is so strong. Evolved over thousands and thousands of years. To ensure their survival. And this could have been born. We said before that it's it's a good time to watch a birth is first thing in the morning for antelope because they're less likely to encounter predators. It just gives that little one a, a, f a few hours to really strengthen its legs and get that coordination down. Guys, don't forget, for new viewers, this is live. So we are watching a brand new kudu calf that in its first few hours of life on live television. amazing little things and him you said that those legs are such delicate little things I know they really do I mean it makes Teresa's um, legend or myth that she put through so sort of relatable because they do have such spindly little legs I of course sympathize in that respect and smiles you were saying the ears are enormous it's amazing I'm genuinely quite touched after all the time. Hey, Brian, all the time we spent with pregnant kudus, looking for them, checking around their usual spots. I have no idea if this is one of the females that we've been watching. I wouldn't be surprised if it is. We're in the right sort of area. This is the second time I've seen a baby kudu in this on this particular road. It seems to be the place for moms, new moms to come and have their babies. Now, I know that the visual is quite difficult behind the bushes there, but obviously I don't want to fracture the trust that she's shown us by shifting and frightening such a young baby. We might have to just wait for her to move out into the open, but she's so comfortable. And TJ? I was so absorbed in watching it wobble that I didn't watch how high it lifts its hooves, but DJ did. That's one of the wonderful things about the way that kudu move, that grace that they have. It's like a, I don't know what you'd call it, a high step. And this little one's still practicing coordination, although at the moment breakfast, first meal of its life, is apparently the most occupying thought in its head. Mom's just giving it a clean to make sure that none of the lingering scent of the birth is around to attract the attention of predators. <laughs> Here she goes. Hey. <laughs> Foxy you were saying the mom was so proud of her new little baby that she brought it out to show us right in the middle of the road and now she's actually really kindly brought it out into the gap for us as well and smiles look at those ears and Jen B sorry yes it would be colostrum um, I find myself not I'm not terribly up to date with exactly how the first lactation occurs within mammal species but the colostrum is the initial production that is secreted straight after birth so Jen B, yes it would be colostrum you need head butting mom I'm so distracted by the the joy of this particular sighting gentle and Eric Eric Moore has picked up on the insects that are around the kudu's neck the newborn kudu 
And Eric, you were wondering if they were ticks that she might have picked up from, or he or she might have picked up from the mother whilst feeding. And I actually, Eric, I've seen them, and I think that they are flies. There you go, you can actually see them on the left side of the neck as we're facing her. I think, I'm going to try and look with binoculars, Eric. I think it's flies. But yes, they do pick up ticks from their mothers. And that process happens very quickly, as you can imagine, with sensitive soft skin. Yeah, if, now that we're seeing it and they've moved off, that one looks like a tick though, Eric. You were right about the one. Some of them are flies. Look at those ears. It's ridiculous. It's so disproportionate. Little wobbly creature. So, going back to the colostrum question that Jane B had raised. So it's the initial milk in its own way produced by the mother and it's very specially designed for newborns coming with a range of antibodies as well as producing a laxative effect and for the life of me I can't remember what the baby's first dung is called or first defecation is called that's a mycodium or a my ah oh, it's gone out of my head but it's a very very different structure and substance to anything else that it will produce for the rest of its life and it's actually quite interesting it's fascinating because it's the byproduct of waste that's developed in the fetus whilst it's been in the uterus which to me is always really fascinating so yes the colostrum will be what's coming through now it's the special milk produced and it has a slight laxative effect to help the baby become a regular suckling again that's it meconium meconium is the baby's first first defecation first poo i've seen the meconium of an elephant baby before totally different in texture and structure thank you rose by the way for triggering that memory Well done, girl. You did good. And I think she must have given birth very close to around here. But of course, the first thing she'll want to do, because the scent of the birth and the placenta and so on, will attract predators. The smell of it or could attract predators if they're in the area. So the first thing she does is nudges that little baby to its feet and then forces it to walk away and when we first came around the corner she was in the process of crossing the road and her little calf was still on the other side and it was trying to hide itself frantically under the branches as we came around it got such a fright shame and if i had known it was there i definitely would have gone much much slower but i had no idea but it's fine and you can see it's relaxed perfectly and luckily mom didn't panic she was also completely relaxed I wouldn't be surprised if it's because we've spent a lot of time sitting with these kudu and given them plenty of space. I'm sure lots of you have put together screenshots and Liz Larpa, you were saying that you'd love to be able to identify this little calf in future and watch it grow to adulthood and maybe we spot it every now and again. Well, I mean, you will have, I'm sure you have screenshots of its little stripes on its side. And as with every animal with patterns like this, just like our spotted hyena, they are unique. Every kudu stripe pattern, no matter how similar they look, will have tiny little differences. So there's absolutely no reason at all why within the live drives, if you see a kudu in the future, we could be able to, or you would be able to identify both mom and calf. Uh, 
I'm sure you'll be sending through lots and lots of screenshots, given the nature of the sighting. She's got a nice, the mother's got a nice V, sort of split stripe, upside down V on her shoulder. Can't see it now, but I saw it when she walked across the road earlier. And you never know, we could well see it grow to adulthood. Well done, Mom. I guess it is on its eye, it looks like a moth around the front of its eye. You can see how on alert she is. And I think because the wind is starting to pick up, something has attracted her attention. She's just being extra cautious though. I think she's gonna move into really dense vegetation now. too soon for me to be able to tell if that was a male or a female calf and obviously I'm not going to go following them into the dense vegetation we've spoken a lot about that before and we said if we did ever have the opportunity to film a live birth that we would not pressurize the kudu in any way and obviously now the same applies we just missed out not that it feels like we've missed out at all I think we were incredibly lucky to have that moment So cool. I'm just watching her body language really carefully. She hasn't stopped what she's doing, so she's quite comfortable with us. But I'm going to just be talking really, really softly. And Liz Lapa, you were wondering if maybe this birth will stimulate the rest of the pregnant kudu to have their youngsters. Oh, look how oh, now I can see that high step. Particularly <laughs> the back right foot, somehow that goes higher. I know it's ridiculous, but I just can't help but think about Bambi now. <laughs> what was I saying? Before I got to try, oh yes, stimulating the rest of the cows to give birth. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it will be pretty much within their own time. Um, I honestly don't know. I think maybe it depends on the level of contact. I know what you're saying. I mean, in terms of the hormones that are released, triggering and having a knock-on effect. But I have honestly no idea if biologically it works that way in Kudu. I'm not sure. I'll double check for you and see what maybe some of the rest of the guides think. But we can also see over the next few days if that does actually occur. And maybe we can draw that as a conclusion or a possibility. wondering about the gestation period. Joel is watching in New York and as far as I know it's slightly longer than Impala. So Impala are about six months or so. I think that Kudu are close to eight or nine months. I'll have to double check exactly. <laughs> Leading a little one into the safety of some really dense vegetation but making its life difficult because there's all kinds of obstacles. So although Kudu don't have a set breeding season in the same way Impala and Wildebeest all drop their calves at the same time. Oh shame. It's so indecisive about which way to go. It wants to follow mom but there's obstacles. Hey mom, you didn't choose an easy path for your little one. Don't go that way baby. There you go, mom's back. Mom's back for encouragement. Cute. Oh, 
Sorry, Joel. You also wanted to know how often could you have calves? It's about once every year to every two years, depending on the circumstances. The calves don't always fall pregnant every season. There's always a peak around this time of year in terms of births. And I think that will probably be our last view of our little kudu calf. A very special way to start the day. I can't see it anymore. I can actually see it. It's still with mum tucked behind the weeping waffle, but I think it's time for us to leave her. Not provide any extra stimulation. She's in very dense vegetation now. And we'll wish her the best of luck in raising that youngster. Definitely not going to get another clear view, but we can have one last look. Hmm? Forward a bit. One last look at the new one. You can see how dense the vegetation is. You can see the little face. Awesome. I love this camera sometimes. It's amazing. Sniffing at its new world. <laughs> All ears and no legs. Hey? I'm still paying very close attention to it. And this next few hours are so crucial in terms of imprinting on each other, forming that maternal offspring bond, getting to know each other's scent and call. And of course for mom, important that she stays so alert. Now, this little calf is going to have to rough it in the wilds of nature for the rest of its life. But Kaomi, you were wondering if we ever treat sick animals within this, within the Sabi Sands or within the greater Kruger area. And Kaomi, only where the injury or the illness has been human induced or caused in some way by human influence. And it's a difficult one to be able to accept because obviously animal lovers around the world would love to be able to help each and every sick and struggling animals but you have to sort of accept that certain injuries and certain events are just part of nature and it's been the way it has been long before we ever came to this area as people or as human beings and will continue hopefully long after we're gone um, but with a huge area like Kruger, it's close to 3 million hectares, you really don't want to be interfering unless absolutely necessary. But obviously, if the animal has become injured, because, for example, it was a failed poaching attempt, often happens, or, for example, it was caught in a snare, which gets set up along the boundaries, and then struggling, obviously, with an injured limb, then yes, people will be, cured, will be called in, to either examine the animal and treat it and hopefully be able to save it or in the worst case scenarios to actually put it down. The only limited exceptions to that might be in cases where it is an endangered species or one that is involved with a serious decline of population. So the first thing that comes to mind is rhino. I know certainly on the reserve that I worked on, which is one of the animals that we provided medical attention to regardless of how an injury was induced, whether it was natural or whether it was human caused. But for the most part, the stance adopted is that as little influence as possible is exerted. And that's because as much as we think we know, we don't know at all. We definitely don't. And these wild areas like this have their own unique ways of managing the populations, the ecosystems. And the more we interfere, actually, the more we actually potentially do more damage than we realize. was really 
truly an incredible moment and I'm so, so glad that you all got to share it with us. I'm sure some of you must be as thrilled as I am. Uh, on the subject of pregnant animals and babies, because that seems to be a reoccurring theme over the last few days, I believe that Scott has found a pregnant impala. So, interesting stuff here. And as you can see, this female's belly is certainly larger than normal, and I'm convinced that she is pregnant and it's not actually uncommon for there to be a wave of secondary births and that's for all the ladies that weren't lucky enough to fall pregnant during the initial rut and for those of you who were following the safaris during may last year you would have remembered the rutting season and after the rutting season there's a chance that the females will give birth a little bit later on and therefore we'll see a kind of second wave of really small impala. So even though most of the young impala that were born in November, December have grown quite a lot, there is a strong chance that in the coming few weeks there'll be a wave of even smaller ones that get born. Not nearly as many that get born in, born in November and December. The initial... Look at this, awesome! Oh no, the camera angle is incorrect. Now you can see all of them. Look at all these ammo falcons that we were talking about earlier. And they fly in huge flocks. I can't see how many have moved over, but I, now that I've just caught them again. I've been watching in the monitor. There's probably about 30 or 40 of them out there. Look at that. And there's a strong chance they'll be hunting up there, catching small insects on the wing. But they also do spend a lot of time feeding on the ground. Once they've found a kind of locust hatching or any kind of plague of little insects, they'll descend onto the ground. But for now, I think they're doing some aerial feeding. Great stuff. And well spotted them as they flew over. of any predators this morning again that's not because they aren't necessarily here but probably because the ground's quite hard and difficult to see where they have moved last night but i was hoping that we we're going to find one or two kind of signs indicating or giving us hope or a direction of movement that we could kind of work in nothing yet though been sign of elephant though and this is the second tree we're gonna to have to move out of the way this morning oh not gonna work this time still connected into the roots so <laughs> no luck VM I don't even know if it's gonna help if you come come and come and try VM is gonna come and try and give me a hand but I'm not convinced it's gonna work this is a bush willow tree it's incredibly powerful okay one two three yeah. there we go VM good work yeah but I fear it's just going to spring back. <laughs> we tried. Well done, Vim. Um, superhuman strength from the cameraman. And at least you've got a, a way past. But the elephants cleverly didn't detach the roots of this bush willow. And therefore, 
plans to decorate the roads are evolving. They're making it more difficult for us to rearrange their decorations. Another kind of decorating that we'll find. Oh, there goes a beautiful big kudu. All different shapes and sizes. None as tiny and cute as the ones you were viewing with Jamie, and it sounds like you had a marvelous sighting there. I don't think I've ever seen a kudu that small, so you guys are all very, very lucky. I'm sure Jamie's in the same boat. To see a young kudu within hours of it being born is extremely fortunate as I was saying though, another kind of exterior decorating that the elephants do is digging holes in the ground and I think Kathy in Memphis Tennessee would like to know how deep will they actually excavate into the ground in search of water and they will often do that in riverbeds, or almost entirely in riverbeds, excavating for water. And it's usually about a meter or so, Kathy. They can't go too much deeper than that because the sand keeps collapsing in on itself. So not much deeper than a meter that I've seen. Also excavate to get out small bulbs, almost like potatoes growing under the ground, that they'll sniff out with their incredible sense of smell, and then use their feet and trunk to dig and excavate. But usually those bulbs aren't too far below the surface of the ground. 20 to 30 centimeters usually is enough. streaming through saying that we should have radioed Jamie for some help moving that tree and you're right we could have used all the help we can get and I think Jamie's been refining her tactics after her collapse yesterday so she's well versed in tree moving now in Wisconsin you are on the ball and oh Nisa apologies um, not Lisa and you've noticed that there's a lot of trees down at the moment and are the elephants restless or what's causing that and it's the lack of food in the drought Lisa if there was the usual summer abundance of lush vegetation the elephants would have had no need to push down trees to access the roots, the leaves on top of the trees and the bark. But because it's tough times, they're kind of behaving as they often would do in winter. When there is less food around, and that's when they'll more typically push down trees in order to access the leaves on the top that are too hard to reach, or the roots and the bark. So different trees will be attacked at different times of the year and also in different conditions. Like I said, now it's the droughts, I think, that's causing these elephants to search high and low for the nutrition they need. observation though and it's wonderful how your observations can really help us tell you a little bit more about what's going on here and keep sending them through it's really wonderful to not only hear questions but also to hear an observation that kind of leads to a question come on Karula we have been searching for you for many hours and it is time you poked your head out. Yay! There's a big heli bull in the road ahead of us. So 
congratulations just come through from Janet from her prior history with Wild Earth long before I arrived and it was at a point when huge floods broke the Juma Dam and Obviously it completely dried out because the dam all broke and all the water went gushing out along with all the fish. But once the dam was fixed... Okay, we need to send you away quickly. I'll continue your question later, Janet. Look who we found! <laughs> it's the obstacle course Yala on its fitness regime. Mm -hmm. Oh, where'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> it's our playful herd of Inyala. We saw them the other day um, doing their mad obstacle course. Here he comes again. Are you going to come through? Oh, that's not playing nice. Come on, little guy. So remember, well, for new viewers, we've actually watched this Inyala herd before, and there's one particular individual especially when it seems to be a bit cooler, that loves to do obstacle courses. And it races around and around and around the herd, whilst watched by these older females in complete dignity. Hmm. I think, unfortunately, we've just come across at the end of the game. I'm not sure if we managed to see that brief flash of white, but I thought it would really entertain you because <laughs> I've enjoyed watching them play like this. It's such fun to watch antelope actually have fun. It's the only way I can describe it is having fun. But I think they've stopped for a break and since they have let's go back over to Scott and have a look at what he's found. Well you don't get much better than this. This is a massive elephant bull. Well he, he doesn't have the hugest body, but he's got beautiful ivory. And he's in full must, so he's in a very sexually heightened stage. And that's why we're just going to give him some space. The reason I know that he's in must is because I can smell the very pungent smell, as well as the fact that he's very wet between his back legs. And that smell that's being emitted is from a liquid that is being permanently secreted from his penis, almost like a broken tap. I'm just going to try and get ahead of him and position the vehicle and allow him to come towards us. There's a little road just up ahead that we'll be able to take. And as we get into position, I can continue answering Janet's question uh, about the drought or telling you about her observation rather from many years ago when the Juma Dam Wall was broken and all the catfish would have been washed away. They wouldn't have probably have had time to bury below the mud in order to kind of seek refuge there. Or maybe they would have. I'm not too sure, Janet. But if they had have all been washed away, there's a chance that baby catfish, tiny little baby catfish, would have been washed in from sources further upstream. You do often find tiny baby catfish in the little rivers between the dams. So there is a chance that the dam was repopulated like that. Let's see what happens here. You may give us some attitude. But... I'm not too concerned at this stage. Look between his legs. You can see how his penis is dripping like a broken tap. There's also that kind of greeny white mold there. You can also see how his back legs are completely wet. Awesome stuff. And they're not always mischievous and troublesome in this sexually heightened state, but naturally they've got a lot of testosterone coursing through their veins, so they can be a little bit unpredictable and that's why it's always better just to err on the side of caution look at him testing the wind there maybe he's got the scent of some ladies up ahead and that's why he's marching on and hope that he'll be able to find some of them what's quite interesting is that elephants will come into must anywhere from two weeks to two months and they're often so boisterous and bad.
badly mannered that females don't really tolerate them, but it does cause them to make sure that they are on the trail of any females that are in season. Look at how wonderful this angle is with his ivory poking out the side of his body, giving you an idea of how big it is. <laughs> well, adrenaline rush, you're right, that is a spectacular elephant, and Jeffrey in Texas has just pointed out that we've caught the culprit that's been pushing down all the trees, red trunked, and I think you guys are both spot on. No, I'm not sure what the best angle is going to be. He's moving quite quickly and I don't want to get too close to him unnecessarily because he is in a bit of a funny mood. He's going to push down the street and quickly uh, that big... Yeah, I think he's going to. Yeah, that trunk up is a good sign. He may just be breaking off branches initially. No, nah, that tree got away luckily. And it just pulled down one branch when they are in this must, M-U-S-T-H, not M-U-S-K, not musk. A lot of people get that confused. When they are in this must state, it is a time that they often push down trees, not so much to feed on them, but simply to show their size and strength. And maybe let off a bit of steam. I'm just going to do a big loop around. We'll catch up with them shortly. That, that he certainly does have beautifully curved ivory, perfect symmetry, and it will be interesting to see how big he gets. I don't peg him as a very old bull, so he could turn into an absolute beauty. We are going to catch up with him shortly, and I think our timing is going to be quite good. Crossing this little road that we own. So I just want to speed up to make sure we don't miss him. smell him already. That smell is incredible. It's a very sweet punch. Oh, well, here he is right in front of us. And there we go. Now he's showing us how big and strong he is. Yes, you are, mister. You're an absolute brute. Oh. to hear that I've at least told one person, Raid Freak, clear up the misconception that it is not musk, it is must. And Raid Freak, it actually is derived from a Hindi word from the Indian elephants. And must in Hindi means mischievous. And that is exactly how they behave when they are in this sexually heightened state, both the Indian and African elephants. to Deck in Germany. Haven't heard your name before and good to have you on board with us. Deck's interested to know how long will they be in this sexually heightened stage for and I'm told that it's anywhere between two weeks and two months. Sadly, 
because elephants move such huge distances and aren't bound to a territory, we don't get to know them individually, and therefore I've never followed an elephant bull to a point where we've seen him coming into must and or going out of must. You usually just get a kind of glimpse of it, them. We may see this guy over the next week or so if we're lucky, but thereafter he'll probably be long gone. Happy to see that he's kind of calmed down now, although looks like he's thinking of getting on the move again. And aren't they wonderfully textured animals with all the crinkles and creases on their wrinkled skin? Now what he may be doing now, which is interesting, is the reason why he may be stopped like this is he is to feed, but he doesn't seem too focused on that. And what is more likely, and what I'm guessing is happening, is that he's picking up infrasonic vibrations through the earth that are being sent by other elephants. So that was my guess. Maybe I'm wrong. But you may agree that he wasn't kind of hugely intent on feeding, but he stopped at all his feet planted firmly on the ground, and those are the receivers for those infrasonic vibrations. Now he's testing the wind again, and I'm wondering... He's holding his trunk quite close to the ground, so I'm wondering if maybe he isn't actually interested in trying to dig up a bulb. Or again, he's maybe just listening and taking in the wind at the same time. through from Wendy in Hampton Bay interested to know that if he does mates will the must kind of come to an end and not as far as I'm aware I think the must period will continue and interestingly Wendy they don't need to be in must in order to mate and like I said a bit earlier because they're so boisterous and bad mannered and kind of almost it's like having a, a, a drunk teenager harassing a lady completely out of tact and out of tune um, I think that's a kind of similar analogy for the bulls and it often doesn't pay dividends whereas bulls who aren't in must who are thinking a little bit more clear headed and with more gentlemanly tactics you may find that they also win over quite a few of the ladies so it's a strange phenomenon that they do come into this stage, yet it's not entirely necessary for them to mate. Uh, they can mate without being in must. Because he's headed into thick bush, we're going to leave him be. Notice that the temporal glands, the gland just behind the eye of the elephants, weren't weeping very heavily and is wondering if that means that he's not in full must. And no, I don't think so. And the temporal gland, as good as an indicator as it can be, it's no guarantee that it's always going to be indicating clearly the state of an elephant. Um, and judging by between his legs and the way his penis is dripping profusely with that liquid, I'm convinced that he is in full-blown must. Those temporal glands were weeping ever so slightly though. They weren't completely dry. Um, but it's not a it's not a sure sure way of uh, finding out where the bulls are and must. It's much better to look between their legs and not to use their heads as a go-to. Usually their body language you can even tell before you've got close enough to smell them or see between their legs. You can see them often draping their trunk over their tusk. That's another very good indicator that an elephant bull is in musk. Why they do that, I don't know. Um, and also they tend to swagger with a little bit more <clears throat> kind of fervor than normal. Now 
targets in Kansas. Sadly, no, I don't think we could qualify that bull as a Tusker. Um, I'm not actually sure if there's a set length that they need to be before they are termed Tuskers, but we're talking double the length of those tusks before they, they, they're in that ballpark and probably double as thick. Tuskers are usually elephants whose tusks are almost touching the ground some of which actually have to hold their heads up higher than normal to prevent their tusks dragging along the ground and they also have the ability of being able to, if they want to have a sleep, they just rest their, rest their oh, there's a little horn bullet to kill. What has it got? It looks like a beetle. Not too sure what type, yeah, it's certainly a beetle. And this is going to be funny because it's not going to be easy for them to dispatch this and or swallow it. What will be also interesting if we don't see any young hornbills come and beg from this one. I've seen quite a few young hornbills that would have just fledged from their nests in the last few weeks. There were none about when I left on leave. And the way to distinguish between a young hornbill and an adult is simply by... Oh, look at that catch! That was phenomenal! Goodbye. This is a little red-billed hornbill. Or am I dreaming? Yeah, it's the red bull horn bull. Um, and uh, the young horn bulls will simply have a much smaller beak than the adults. This one luckily didn't have any youngsters pestering it for a meal. Wasn't that remarkable though to see how incredibly accurate it was with its beak as it dropped that little beetle and then caught it on the way down. As I was saying, the big elephant bulls will rest their head down on their, on their tusks or their tusks on the ground and then just have that as a perfect pillow to sleep on, the big bulls. There's a few wandering around the Kruger National Park at the moment and there's actually an incredible museum at one of the camps in the Kruger Park that are open to the public called Lataba. And after the show you can maybe have a Google the Lataba Museum and I'm sure you'll get some images of the magnificent bulls that once roamed the Kruger. They've also actually got a lot of the ivory in that museum um, that you can go and see and I mean it's huge. The ivory is much longer than your average human being. Sometimes eight feet, seven, eight, nine, ten feet in length. Obviously that's including the root that would be in the gums of the, the elephants, but they are monstrous. Probably this thick at the base. Margaret's still on the topic of must and she'd like to understand a bit more about why what is the point of must if it's not a necessity for mating and it's a good point and the only kind of rational theory that I can come up with is that the the likelihood of elephant bulls pursuing females and therefore not missing out on opportunities where females need to mate um, that, that must uh, induces males to, to look out for females and therefore be around when there are estrus females. Because elephant bulls aren't always attached to a herd, I think that must pair just in, ensures that both parties meet up or increased likelihood of those both parties meeting up in order to mate. But there's a lot of animals that, that don't have fixed males within their herds, like kudu for example, like giraffe who don't have must but they simply keep track of where the females are and tag along when the time is right so who knows i'm not sure if you guys have seen any knob-billed geese or is it a knob-billed knob duck i think it's a knob-billed duck i haven't seen one for so long but i'm fairly certain that's one flying off in the distance it is it's way way far off but we may just possibly be able to get a glimpse 
of its funny knob bill notes disappeared behind the tree. You've got a glimpse of the bird though, but they are around and I saw a few flying over before I went on leave. This may be a new bird for some of you to add to your list. Where are the ducks hiding? Knob bill duck, 18 to 20. Comb duck is what they are now called. They used to be called the knob bill duck. And that is what we just saw flying away. So we need to keep our eyes out. Obviously you can see that very big knob on the bill or comb on the bill of the male. And they intra-African migrants, so they come from further north up in Africa in order to come and breed down here. Good. Are well, we going to send you across to Jamie to see how she's getting along? I hear that Scott has been taking over my role as chief tree remover. And I'll have to share something with you for those of you who were watching yesterday afternoon. First of all, I went to sleep giggling at myself and woke up giggling at myself. Uh, it was absolutely hilarious and I'm so glad that you could all watch it with me. The second thing I'd like to share with you, actually, it's something that only I could see and that was Beam's face. And the grin, he was, he was so happy. It made his day. And thank goodness he was on camera and not helping me because at least we managed to capture what can only be described as a Janie moment. I sent a message through to my parents, I sent them the link to the video. Thank you Suzanne, by the way, for being so quick off the mark, genuinely, because apparently my parents were crying with laughter when they watched it, so was my brother. And they've nicknamed that, uh, it's something we've commonly referred to in my family as a Janie moment. And believe it or not, they're not all that uncommon. Particularly around my teenage years where I grew upwards about a foot and my limbs all extended and I never quite got used to the exact reach of them. <laughs> so I'm glad that you all enjoyed it. I wish you could have seen Viam's face. Viam is typically very stoic and incredibly professional and I know absolutely that if I had asked him to hop out to help, he totally would have. He's helped me with tyres before, he's always been a complete gentleman. But I'm glad that he was on camera to capture that particular moment. Hey, Buffalo? I'm sure this Buffalo Bull agrees. And for them, it's incredible to see how the grass has changed. Hey, look at the dew claws. You can see where those toes used to be back in the day. I chatted a bit about this with warthogs. You've got those residual hooves from a time back when buffalo had more toes than just two. Those are the remnants, evolutionary, evolutionarily wise. I'm not quite sure that's the term I was going for, but we'll do it. We'll go with it. Impressive set of horns on this particular gentleman. Nice and broad. And as you can see, as he's nibbling around the drainage line, just a couple of downpours have been enough to bring out the fresh green shoots of grass. It's completely changed over the last few days. Charlotte, who's watching in Port Elizabeth, it's great to hear from you again. I'm sure you must be getting really excited. Charlotte's going to be starting her training in Sabi Sabi in February, I believe. And Charlotte, you wanted to know, while we were watching that squirrel grooming, and occasionally you see buffalo do it, um, definitely seen kudu and other antelope species groom as well, you were wondering if they actually eat the fleas or the ticks or the mites or whatever they pull off their fur in those grooming pro within that grooming process. You were wondering if it has any kind of nutritional value. I will say this, Charlotte, I've never seen them spit it out. I've never seen them spit out a tick or a flea. When we were watching that squirrel, he didn't pull anything out of his mouth. 
So yes, I think a certain amount must be ingested. In terms of nutritional value, I wouldn't say it's a huge portion of their diet. Um, they will carry a little bit of protein, but nothing hugely significant in my opinion. You know, it's not like an ox picker that's trying to consume. Come on, ox picker, come and land on the buffalo conveniently. Nope. Would have been interesting, but it's not like an ox picker that consumes about a thousand ticks in a day. Those gro that grooming motion is um, fairly inconsistent in terms of the rewards that it yields. And it's really just a way of removing the parasites and the scratches and the itches. It's always fascinating to watch how some animals groom more than others. Impala are particularly well adept at keeping themselves clean and parasite free. Also happens to be the smallest antelope that an ox picker will be allowed to sit on. Whereas buffalo, I guess they don't really have the same level of dexterity and flexibility with that huge muscular neck holding up those enormous horns that this gentleman has, you can imagine that it would be quite tough to be able to twist and turn and groom, which is why you've got loads and loads, usually, of ox pickers sitting on them. I've seen this buffalo before. He's got really a really impressive set of horns. They spread out far. They curve up beautifully symmetrical, symmetrically. I would say that he is a handsome gentleman as buffalo go. Uh, it's such a pity. I did, Country West, I did think about that when it happened, um, that if perhaps we had been on Jigger, we could have had the full 360 range experience with the VR rig of when I tried to pull down the tree and fell over, for those of you who missed it. It was spectacular, totally dignified, done with incredible um, coordination. <laughs> There's nothing like a tree branch snapping when you're pulling, all of, pulling against it with all of your weight. And of course, the worst part is if I'd thought it through, I might actually have done it properly. Um, <laughs> Country West, I wish we'd had the VR rig up because then you would have been able to turn around and watch VM's reaction, which I imagine at the time must have been priceless. He is so professional. How he didn't, I don't know, I mean, how he didn't just forget about the camera completely, I don't know. Luckily for all of us, maybe me excluded, he didn't, and he captured the entire thing. It's a pity we didn't have it on the VR rig. <laughs> We were on Rusty, unfortunately, and it's Jigger that carries the virtual reality setup. I think that would have been a video for the books, though. <laughs> Buffalo negotiating. And those dead and fallen logs provide really nice shelters for the seed banks and the fresh green vegetation that grows through there. It's always a good spot to go when you're looking for food that isn't quite so dried out. Yes, hello, we are here. Hi, boy. Brian, I wish you could have been there for the fall as well. You would have loved it. <laughs> it was pretty funny. He's looking, oh, he's not in terrible condition, a little bit thin, but all of the animals are looking a little bit thin in coping with this drought. He's still got plenty of muscle on him. A most distinguished buffalo boy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has been as always a pleasure and a privilege to drive with you on the back of the vehicle, Brian. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you were there as well to witness the newest arrival to Juma, that tiny little kudu calf. What a special moment. Mm, fantastic. Really, really cool. The thumb enjoyed it as well. I think the thumb appreciated that really incredible time we got to spend with a brand new wobbly little kudu calf. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, as well as to the lovely ladies in FC, Nikki and Kirsty, and to Eugene as well as to Scott and to VM out on the other vehicle. Have a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. I'm going to say goodbye for now. Cheers.
Well, happy to hear that Gerard posted a picture of a big tusker that he saw outside Sitara and camp that's not too far away from us. It's almost kind of directly east from us in the Kruger National Park. And in that area, I have seen lots of big tuskers. So thanks for doing that, Gerard, and hope all is well in Saudi Arabia. Everyone, thank you so much for your contributions, questions, and joining in on the morning safari with Jamie and myself. It's been great fun as always. Well done to VM on camera, to Nikki and Kirsty in the final control room, and I'm already looking forward to the afternoon adventure with all of you. See you next time.